afternoon. All right. Yeah, what the, you know, we're, we're talking trucking, we're talking fuel efficiency, we've got um, outstanding speakers, so uh, we're, we're gonna have a great time for the next hour. Thanks for stopping in, and uh, welcome to Matt's. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I saw a line, I walked by the registration about 11 o'clock this morning, and the line was down to here, so uh, just, to, just to register and get in. So, uh, you know, exciting times in trucking, we will, uh, we will get into some of those. Um, but you know, I, I do think this is the time that you guys are taking advantage of coming to an event like Matt's to learn. You know, what's the real talk about things like electric trucks, autonomous trucks just got off the stage here in B104, to um, you know, all kinds of things that are gonna probably upset our industry a bit if you're gonna be in it for the next 10, 20 years, maybe five. And so uh, we're, we're going to talk about some of that today, and um, I'm really excited to be here. My name's Mike Roth. Uh, I lead the North American Council for Freight and Efficiency. We, uh, we're a nonprofit that does a lot of work on um, all of these sort of technologies that help you save fuel, <laughs> move more freight, save money, uh, also become more sustainable in your operations. So um, I'm really excited to, to host this today. Um, our host is the Shell Rotella brand. So uh, thanks to them, they're number one diesel engine oil among hardworking owner operator drivers and they appreciate the confidence that um, you have in their products. <coughs> All right, read this real carefully. Um, <laughs> this is uh, something that Shell's required to post uh, as they uh, are a public company. It says that all the statements today are based on uh, current expectations and, and are not binding on, on future predictions. Uh, the presentation that we're going to be going through, uh, you know, is a, a real discussion around, like I said, saving fuel, saving money, being more efficient. We're going to go through the. Um, we're going to go through uh, some details about a new engine oil category called PC12. It's aligned with um, what's coming with some engine changes in 2027. We'll also explore um, strategies for truck drivers to boost fuel economy, looking at existing technologies and practices. Um, things like low viscosity lubricants, aerodynamic improvements that can be made on tractors and trailers, and benefits of low rolling resistance uh, tires and, and, and much more. Um, a couple of thoughts from, from me before we dive in. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit that really does look at all these things in a real, you know, pragmatic and unbiased way. So if you want to have a look at NACFI.org or RunLS.com, there's, there's information there uh, for you to get to. But as we think about what's coming in, in trucking, um, first of all, uh, we've always wondered and worked on fuel economy. I mean, why not lower your expenses and be more efficient with fuel? Uh, we've also been worried about the future of diesel prices. Uh, you know, we do sit here around $4. It's been kind of $4 for maybe a decade with, you know, some times where it dipped. But, uh, you know, there's always those worries about higher fuel prices. Uh, and what could happen if we were, um, you know, I don't know, five, six dollars. Uh, another thing that's driving uh, what we see coming in this world of decarbonizing or, or using less petroleum-based fuels is, uh, is around regulations. So whether it's California, but now uh, federal government, other states, even local communities that are banning um, and, and moving towards zero emission vehicles, um, that, that regulations is driving it. And finally, uh, the public and, um, you know, a lot of us uh, driving for more sustainability in everything we do and trucking isn't, uh, you know, immune to that. So what does that mean for us? Um, at NACV, we believe it's burning less diesel to be efficient. That is decarbonizing. I get really frustrated um, when the only thing talked about is electric trucks and hydrogen trucks and that sort of thing. And they will be an important part of this. But if we burn less diesel, it's a really good thing. Um, we should go to zero where we can, so we've done a lot of work on battery electric trucks. Amazing pieces of equipment, really simple, and um, will be a, a good part of our, uh, you know, moving freight around the country, probably in urban and city and short spoke runs and that sort of thing. And then there's alternatives like renewable fuels, renewable diesel, renewable natural gas, possibly hybrids in trucks. So there are things that can be done on this path to, to, to zero uh, as we move forward. So here's our panel. Um, we have uh, Karen Howman, who is uh, uh, OEM technical manager at Shell. She'll have some interesting thoughts to go through. through. We'll also have Jeff Harmony, 
He is the uh, project manager for the American Petroleum Institute that'll talk about this uh, new oil standard I was mentioning. We also have Ryan Mantheri. He's project leader for Shell's Global Solutions and leads the Shell Starship Initiative, which has been really fun to watch. Um, now uh, demonstrating Starship 3, the third generation. And finally, we'll have Tanya Miracle. She's the director of the OEM Truck Channel for Bridgestone. So let's start with uh, Jeff. Come up. Thank you all very much for, for being here today. I know there's a lot going on out there that could uh, take up your time, but I'm, I'm happy you've chosen to spend it with us for a little bit. So welcome and have a great show. Um, so I'm with the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, American Petroleum Institute is a trade association that represents oil and natural gas, but we also have a lot of programs that we use to uh, ensure the quality of lubricants and diesel exhaust fluid around globe and I've, I've, I've been doing this for about 15 years uh, licensing engine oils against specifications and then we test these engine oils out in the aftermarket sort of in a you know consumer protection phase uh, to, to ensure that these products meet the specifications um, so that's sort of how I cut my teeth in, 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 in getting here but what I'm going to speak to you uh, today about is what's coming down the pike so he's mentioned PC12, call that proposed category 12, and that's sort of the lingo before you end up with a CK4 or a CJ4 afterwards. So uh, right now, because of impending regulations that are coming down, uh, uh, down the pike for heavy duty on-road diesels in 2027, uh, you know, EMA has been looking to request a new category to help, uh, help the engine manufacturers uh, achieve the goals and the targets that, that the EPA are, are, are setting forth for us. So I'll just talk a little bit about that right now. Um, tw back in 2021, which is goodness, three years ago already, uh, basically the engine manufacturers came uh, to us and, and gave us a list of here are the things that we need out of the lubricants. Um, that we're going to need in order to be able to uh, meet our promises to the EPA. Um, and so since that time, uh, the three tripartite, I, I like to refer to it as the, uh, the oil marketers, the additive companies whose products go into the base oils to give, give engine oils its properties, uh, as well as the o OEMs have all been working hand in hand uh, since that time to not only evaluate the category through the NCET there, uh, which was evaluated and decided, yeah, we can do this. So we're now in the middle of, of our development process and we're working towards what will eventually be the, uh, you know, the replacement for API CK4 and API FA4, which are the current, current on, uh, on highway uh, oils. Um, and we're shooting to start licensing as API, shooting to start licensing these oils and, and of course testing them in the aftermarket. Uh, beginning of, of 2027 when the model year engines uh, are upon us. Uh, again, this all came down uh, from ultimately EPA's final ruling on emissions um, and essentially this is the first update to emissions uh, that we've had in, in about 20 years or so and they're going to be 80 percent stronger than even today's standards so we're bringing out as, as much emissions as we can um, and uh, what that has ultimately led the engine manufacturers to come to our industry and begin to work with us to do is to provide these uh, improvements that you see on the screen before us. Um, they've asked for increased oxidation protection. Oxidation is bad for maintaining viscosity, lower oxidation. Uh, your viscosity range is gonna stay where it's at for longer periods of time. They wanted new wear test capabilities. Um, to ensure that, uh, you know, as we trend towards lower viscosities, which you can see in the, in the next bullet, uh, you want to make sure that we're, we're, we're ramping up the wear as well. Uh, they sort of go hand in hand. Um, as you can see there, uh, the industry is, is, is following that trend. You know, FA4 was the first set of oils that uh, took us down into sort of the 10W30 categories, 5W30 in some rare instances. Uh, they've, they've now asked that we can, we can bring those viscosities down all the way into the XW20s. So uh, we're going to be working on a category to replace FA4. Um, one of the things that came through the regulations that uh, the, the OEMs are going to be required to cover the useful life and the uh, warranty periods 
especially of the after treatment for longer periods of time. So there's some certain uh, chemistries that others can talk about uh, more than I can right now that are just going to enable protection of that aftermarket, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the after treatment systems um, for longer periods of time. Uh, they've also asked because of uh, new types of elastomers that are showing up in, in their engine designs around seals and things of that nature to uh, expand compatibility of the engine oils with those, with those new elastomers. So we're working on that as well. And, uh, you know, again, I touch, touch, touch point here on the sustainability of the equipment. Let's, let's, you know, sustainability isn't just more than fuel economy. It's, it's taking the equipment that we have, making it last longer. Uh, and thereby using less resources, if you think about it that way. So as a result of all these things that the Engine Manufacturers Association has asked from us, uh, you know, we're, 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 they want improved oil performance and, and, and we're in the middle of delivering that. Now this is a little bit into the weeds, but the, the, for the current category, these are the things that were uh, sort of the update to where we're at in the development phase right now. So we had a few tests that uh, there are the, the, the cap one end, the roller follower wear tests that are deemed redundant. We've, we've been asked to seek a replacement for the MAC T11 test. That's a, that's a test that's running out of parts and will be essentially obsoleting the ability to uh, run, run lubricant tests on those engines. So we've, we're in the middle of uh, signing a replacement test for that through the use of the Cummins ISB engine. Um, we've added another, um, it's, it's a test that's commonly run already, but it's formally being adopted into the category, uh, and that's the Detroit Diesel uh, DD13 um, scuffing test. All sorts of stuff going in there around testing with the new elastomers that we're starting to see. Uh, we are in the, uh, the negotiation processes of, of lowering saps, that's sulfated ash, uh, phosphorus, sulfur limits, uh, all of these things help with the sustainability and the, and the durability of the equipment, the uh, useful life of the equipment. And what, what the result's going to be is probably CL4, that hasn't necessarily been decided yet, but think about it that way for now, will be a new category that will, as in the past, be the backwards compatible category to some of the older categories that were specified for the older equipment and uh, they're working on a new FB4, we'll call it that for now, but as yet not formally adopted to be named that, but uh, that, will, that will replace the API FA4 um, as we again trend towards these lower viscosities and, and, and these new engines that are going to require them. So the way that we do this is we work with the industry, all, all facets of it, uh, hand in hand to come together, negotiate, consensus process. These standards will all be balloted by a, uh, through consensus process. And, uh, and then we at API, this is what I know the best, is we're going to start licensing these engine oils. You'll see the API certification marks on these products as they're launched in the, in the early part of 2027. And, uh, you know, that there are organizations around the world that specify API standards, which is where these, these all these technical specs are housed in, in API uh, 1509, for those of you that really want to dig into the weeds and, and learn about it. Uh, but they're cited by nations and states around the globe. And, and, and as I said, we back that up with an aftermarket audit program and interesting, difficult tasks to uh, get around and sample and test maybe the 24,000 different licensed engine oils that we currently have in the marketplace. And if you throw on top of that another couple hundred uh, DEF uh, license, uh, licensees, we've, we've got our work cut out for us. So um, many OEMs obviously are recommending API licensed oils and DEF in their applications. So sort of how I fit into the group here. and, and uh, and if you have any questions when we get to it, please, please, uh, you know, I'll be hanging around afterwards and asking what have you. And I'll just let Karen come on up and, and give her give her talks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. So. Um, you know, Jeff has gone into some great detail on, on what the PC12 category is and, and kind of what you can expect. And so I thought I'd ping back on that and just talk a little bit about the how. How does a category get developed? Uh, there's not a whole lot of detail. 
right now about exactly what it's going to mean for formulations. We're focusing now on what the performance requirements are. And over the years, as we get through this process more, you'll start to hear more technical details of what you can expect and what that's actually going to mean for your fleet. And we'll start to be able to, over the coming years, really quantify uh, what the benefits are and, and what you can expect. So uh, just going in a little bit about the, the how. Um, so, and the who. So, this is an industry collaborative effort. Shell has always been very involved with API and the development of the new standards and the new specifications. And there's really three groups in the industry um, that are um, highly interested and collaborate together to be able to put the, the category requirements together. Uh, do all the development and get it through to where you know, we're at the point where we're, we're licensing with API. And those three groups are EMA, the Engine Manufacturing Associations that come with the need and what the performance requirements are uh, that, that they need us to focus on to be able to enable their goals to meet the uh, EPA requirements and their, uh, their targets. Uh, the next group is the oil marketers. So those of us that make the product, put it in a bottle, put it in a drum, and, and get it to you for your truck. And then third is the um, ACC, or the American Chemistry Council, and they're um, our technology partners that uh, develop the additive systems and the technology to be able um, to meet all of the performance requirements of the, of the standard. And these three groups all work together to make sure that all of the aspects of the category are met and that it's actually something that can be produced um, and, and licensed. And the objectives and the priority of, of the categories of, of all three groups involved are to enable new engine technologies. So as you know, hardware is advancing in technology, engines are, are improving, the engine manufacturers are, are working to advance the technology, and they need, in some cases, us to improve the quality of the oil or certain performance aspects to be able to enable those, uh, those improvements, whether it's dealing with higher temperatures or uh, lower viscosity to be able to meet their emission targets. They're, they're not able to do that by themselves. It's a collaborative e effort between them developing the hardware and us supplying them oil that, that provides the performance that allows them to be able to meet their targets. And, and the third thing, and these are not in any particular order, these are all of equal importance, but backward compatibility. So the big question when we started to develop PC12 was, how do we take this new engine technology and new engine oil technology kind of into the next level while still being able to perform and protect engines that are 25 years old. It's, it's of the utmost priority that we ensure that the new engine oils are backward compatible and that they meet the requirements and the needs of the new engines and also have that same protection and performance for your older engines. So that's always a challenge that we're we're, we're working on to ensure that we are backward compatible to the legacy hardware. And the reason why um, you hear, it seems like every time we come to MATS every year, we have you know, a little more to talk about um, than we did last year. It's a long process. It takes about five years. We're on a cycle now where the standards are in effect about on a 10 year cycle. And it takes us about five years to develop a new standard. Um, and the process is we have to identify what the performance needs are. What is it that we're trying to do? What improvements are we trying to make? And then um, we have to um, establish the engine test to make sure that, that we have the, the apparatus and the test to be able to test that performance and that those tests are consistent. We go through matrix testing to make sure that the tests have precision and discrimination. And then we have a technology demonstration period where we're working on developing the candidate oils. And Shell's part in that is um, in addition to the API requirements, we put the oil in trucks on the road and run millions of miles of fleet testing and then tear the en engines down to ensure the performance requirements are being met and that we're uh, maintaining that backward compatibility and that protection. That takes um, 
you know, about a year or so. And then we uh, kind of, that culminates in us setting the limits. What are the targets for each of the tests that are required in the API standard? And then um, we have a, a one year kind of mandatory waiting period where uh, everybody, all the oil marketers are, are working to get their, their products ready for retail and ready to be sold and implemented in the market. And that's about, about a five-year process. So in the next year, the next time you come to Maps, we're going to have some more detail about actually what uh, the performance enhancements are and what you can kind of expect in terms of what you can see in the differences between CK4 and the new uh, PC12 category that we're expecting uh, in, um, in time for the model year 2027 engines is the plan. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Ryan Mantheri talk about uh, Starship. Hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Ryan Manti. I'm the project lead for the Starship initiative. And if you're not familiar with the program, uh, the chart you see on the screen right there is the third iteration or the third evolution in a program we started back in 2018. Uh, we launched the first truck, which was a diesel platform, and it was really meant as a material demonstration for the sector to showcase how we can collaborate, reduce, uh, or make significant reductions in energy usage and CO2 emissions. Um, so what I'm going to try and talk to you through the time I have is, is look specifically at the technologies that enable that. Um, so the truck itself is built around this concept called freight ton efficiency. And effectively what that is, is the truck's ability to carry the maximum payload using the least amount of energy. And to do that, there's, there's specific key enablers um, of design principles that we have to adhere to. And those principles dictate the technologies we feature on the truck. Uh, so starting off, uh, one of, sorry. So at its core, at the foundation, it is this concept called lightweighting. So we try and strip as much of the weight of the tractor and trailer base setup. Um, to do that, we start to, we start to look at lighter compounds, things like uh, uh, utilizing innovative additive manufacturing technologies, uh, variable thickness materials that lighten the actual frame itself. And we're seeing a lot of work in the, that the OEMs are doing today where uh, they're trying to lighten the frames. Uh, we expect they will get lighter on a magnitude of 30 to 40 percent going forward. Um, and this is important because the, the, the overall intention of this program is to, is to try and load as heavy as possible. And while that might seem counterintuitive because when you increase the payload, there's certain adverse effects that you have to deal with. Things like rolling resistance increases, uh, aerodynamic drag increases, uh, even the energy required to, to accelerate the truck up a grade. Uh, but all of that is a fixed cost that becomes less significant the more goods you shift per time. Um, so this is one area that we looked at extensively. Starship uh, 3.0 actually features a Meritor Fuel Light 6x2 axle configuration. And what we've done there is we've gone with a lighter frame from the get-go that allows us to go heavy on payload. It also allows us to actually uh, utilize other additional technologies on the truck. So we know there's a balance, there's a fine balance between the payload, the new technologies we want to put on the truck, and then, so we look to optimize on, uh, on the weight savings across all the chassis and trailer. Uh, another significant area where we have to kind of mitigate against is, or significant force that we have to mitigate against, is um, rolling resistance. And uh, Tanya will, will basically touch on this in a bit more detail, but effectively, this is caused by the force um, when the tire is basically repeated flexing on the sidewalls, and it happens when the tires are under a significant load. And with this truck here, when we're going very close to 80,000 pounds. So you can imagine, as the tire rolls through its footprint, there's the potential for a significant energy loss. So tire selection is critical, especially in terms of trying to minimize the heat generation and the uh, tire deflection that we experience. So Bridgestone's been actually fantastic in helping us dial that setup in across our tractor and trailer setup. Uh, next, we have the heart of the Starship, uh, in essence, is the powertrain. And we, 
like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Starship 3.0 features a natural gas platform. That is Cummins' latest X-15 natural gas engine, and it's paired with a heat and endurant. Uh, and you see the additional supplementary fuel delivery and storage system attached to the truck. Um, we have side, drain, uh, side uh, frame rail mounted tanks because real estate on the truck is quite tight, as you can imagine, and I'll show you what that looks like with the Aeropack when that comes into frame. But we had to be very clever in the way we install these tanks uh, on the truck because space is an issue. Um, the, the engine itself has uh, quite good comparative com uh, performance in relation to the X15 uh, diesel, purely because the power and torque curve is very similar. So in terms of power output, you have a similar, similar type of performance, which is really good. Um, and if this is basically the heart of Starship, the lubricant then serves as a slide foot. And um, it's, it's interesting because with these engines, they burn quite much hotter than the diesel. So oxidation protection is critical. And uh, you heard Jeff and Ken talk about uh, you know, the FA4 category oils. Um, we're utilizing Shell's Rotella T4 uh, natural gas plus formulation in this truck. This is an SAE 5W30 uh, FA4 synthetic engine oil. And it's really there to target uh, stability control, aeration control, oxidation stability. Um, um, it has a lower high temperature, high shear viscosity range, which means it sits between 2.9 and 3.5 uh, safety points. So uh, that, I bring that up, I mention that because there's a direct co correlation between that HTHS viscosity range and fuel economy. The lower the HTHS, the better the fuel economy. And you have to remember what we're trying to do again. We're trying to go as heavy as possible in the highest gear at the most engine speed. You need a lubricant that can withstand that kind of you know, robust duty cycle. So, um, I will close off with basically talking about the error package of this truck because it's quite significant. Um, let me just skip ahead here so we can put this into frame. So, aerodynamic drive is another significant opposing force acting on the truck. Basically, this is created when the air is hitting the front of the truck. This force this gets created when it hits the front of the truck. But if there's not an equal and opposite force pressing down on the rear of the trailer, then you have what we call turbulent airflow. And if we don't manage this correctly, the truck ends up expending a lot of energy overcoming this friction. So when we optimize the aero package across the tractor and trailer, we're really looking at turbulent air zones uh, from back to front. So where can we reduce those, uh, those low pressure wake zones? Uh, so I'll start with the, the tractor itself. You can see it's, it features a very lightweight aerodynamic carbon fiber cap. Um, this is a very uh, aggressive design in terms of the hood, the windshield. Uh, we have extended uh, roof bearings. Uh, our, and uh, an aggressive rounded A pillar. We also, you'll note, have uh, a side, side uh, mirror eye camera based system that replaces your know, traditional mirrors. So, no worries. Um, and uh, we have a, uh, a compact bumper and air damp system along with an automated gap sealer that basically deploys panels from the back of the cab to cover the tractor trailer gap um, as the truck is moving at highway speeds. So basically what this ensures is you have smooth body lines and airflow. Because essentially what we want to do is the front of the truck is, a, is like a tip of a sword, right? And you're punching, when the truck's moving at, at highway speeds, you're punching a hole through that air. And you want to ensure that the air sticks to the profile of the truck and then transitions along to the end of the trailer. So with that, let's look at the trailer itself. So trailer design has traditionally been pretty ubiquitous in geometry, um, primarily because you know the, the, it, it's essentially a rectangular box. So, uh, but over the past decade, there's been significant innovations that have come about that allow us to reduce the drag uh, experience towards the end of the trailer. Things like belly pans, full and side skirts, uh, trailer rear diffusers, and most notably, you see the bow tail there on the rear of the truck. Um, and obviously this custom bow tail is basically designed to reduce 
the drag that's created by the low pressure wake at the end of the trailer as the air exits the rear of the truck. Now, when all of these things are working in unison, this is kind of a visual representation of that. Um, Charles Starship has a coefficient of drag of about 0.25. So to put that in perspective, the average production truck on the road sits at around 0.6. So it means our aerodynamic drag on that truck is half that of what's currently out there on the road. And you see the benefit of that in terms of its performance, in terms of its freight efficiency and fuel economy. There's a direct correlation. When this package is balanced right and set up correctly, and provided you haven't uh, overcompensated of weight, um, you can see savings on fuel economy in the order of magnitude between five and 10%. So there's a real benefit from this. Um, I will basically close on this. Um, so um, the aero package on the truck, um, that we designed for this truck has been an iterative process. We started in 2018 with the first con when we conceptualized the design. Uh, what's interesting uh, is the uh, CFD analysis we've done on the cab itself, uh, and uh, you know the, the regional testing and the demonstration runs. We've begin been able to actually significantly improve on our uh, coefficient of drag going forward. Um, the program itself has always been meant as a uh, blueprint for so what we can pass down in terms of the knowledge transfer to the rest of the sector. So we, it's about showcasing the best of currently available technologies that you know OEMs, fleet operators, owners can go out and try and adopt. And if, even if it's not the entire package as its own, uh, but being able to adopt certain elements from there and, and bring it into your into your fleet. Um, We've had reasonably good success with this uh, with this truck. We've launched it in uh, 2023 at Act Expo, and we did a demonstration run in October last year, uh, where we drove it up from North Carolina through the West Corridor, uh, West Coast Corridor. So, um, and we did a demonstration run where we achieved a fuel economy of nine miles uh, per gallon DGD. So. Um, in terms of performance, um, natural gas is, is, is basically um, comparatively uh, um, decent compared to a diesel platform. Um, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, the most, we, we did a, 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 a report on the uh, efficiency study on 2.1, sorry, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, where we benchmarked our truck against the national average. Um, there's also an interesting uh, read, if you look at the NACFI report that was released I think a couple of weeks ago on the Super Truck 2 program. And in that, it references um, the, what they call the idealized uh, trailer tractor speed form. And it's interesting how closely that version of that truck matches what we've done here. So it's a good proof point. Um, so yeah, uh, I'd encourage you to have a read of that. It's available. This has always meant, this has always been meant as an open source material. So uh, you, everything I've discussed now, although it's light touch, you can look it up for yourself. And if you have any questions, happy to take that at the end of the Q and A. Director of the OE Truck Trailer Channel at Bridgestone. I'll talk to you about reducing CO2 emissions through tires. So I'm going to start by introducing um, our Bridgestone EA commitment. Um, at Bridgestone, our EA commitment says um, it's the eight words that outline how we'll work together with our partners to co-create and ensure that everything we are doing moves us towards a more sustainable society. Those eight words um, drive every decision we make to ensure that we are making a positive, sustainable impact. Um, and I'm gonna tell you which three words I'm gonna kind of focus on today. I'm gonna focus on efficiency, obviously fuel efficient tires. I'm gonna focus on ease, because everything I'm gonna speak about is readily available today and can be implemented very easily. Um, and I'll speak about economy. So all of the things we talked about really will drive to lower cost overall, over the total um, life cycle of your truck. 
So let's talk first about um, tire selection. As Ryan said, tire selection is very, very critical to ensuring that um, you're getting the best fuel economy you can get. High fuel efficient tires are gonna drive down the cost of your fuel by um, requiring you to use less fuel. Um, there are two other factors though when making a tire selection that also will help with CO2 reduction. One of those factors is ensuring that not only are you choosing a high fuel efficient tire, but also choosing one that's balanced with long tread wear. So people don't typically think about reducing CO2 emissions um, with long tread life, but if you think about a product lasting a longer time, we have to produce less of them. And if we have to produce less of them, we are um, having less energy burns um, and less CO2 emitted. Um, the third factor in choosing a tire is ensuring that you have a retreadable casing. Um, retread, which I'll talk about on our next slide, um, is a highly sustainable process. It reduces materials needed um, and, um, and helps reduce energy overall. And then, you know, one of the key factors that drive your fuel efficiency really will be ensuring that you have those fuel efficient and are making those decisions across all positions of your truck. So you can see from that graphic there that every position of the truck and trailer um, make a pretty large impact to the fuel efficiency. And many, many people believe it all comes from the truck, but you'll see 43% of that fuel efficiency is coming from you dragging that, that loaded trailer. So it's important to have fuel efficient tires across the entire rig. So next let's talk a little bit about retread. So retread, I call it the OG sustainable solution. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking a tire that you already bought as a new tire, it's a fuel efficient tire, which means the casing and what's left of it after you've used it is still fuel efficient. Um, and you are putting on a new tread and renewing and recycling that tire. Um, that, that process reduces energy consumption. It reduces the need for us to mine new raw materials. Um, it also reduces CO2 emissions by 24% because we are not manufacturing a new tire. All we're doing is putting a new tread on your existing casing. The stat that always sticks with me when I start thinking about retread is that if you put a retreaded tire on all 18 wheel positions of, um, of grid, you would be able to power 482 homes for one day um, from the energy you save versus producing 18 new tires. That's, that's a lot of homes. So we always talk about, oh, we need fuel efficiency, we need better materials, but one of the really simple things that we can do is we can control the air pressure in our tires, and that will really optimize our fuel efficiency and wear. You know, in the past, that's been tedious and cumbersome because we've had to send someone out to measure the air pressure, right? It's, it's been a manual job. But with our transition to data and data analytics, now if you have a simple TPMS system or any kind of air monitoring system on your truck and trailer, it's very, very easy to make sure that you are running at that optimum air pressure, which will optimize your fuel efficiency and optimize your tread wear. Okay, this is my final slide, and I would really be remiss to not talk about the future. All of the things I've already spoke about, you can do today. It'll make a huge measurable impact on reducing CO2 emissions, um, increasing your fuel efficiency, um, lowering your total cost of ownership. But I really do need to mention the things that we're doing for the future that will move us even further. Um, things like renewable rubber from a liability plant, um, right now, natural rubber comes from a Havea tree um, in Indonesia or Northern Africa. Um, Wyoli is a crop that can grow and be farmed just like um, you know, corn or wheat. Um, however, it grows in desert climate, so we're not disrupting the farming. Um, we're not displacing a corn um, crop. And it, it really is a great alternative source to natural, to natural rubber. Um, recovered carbon black. Uh, so 
Being in the tire industry, we are some of the worst offenders of CO2 emissions because we use so much carbon. That's what makes the tires black, right? So recovered carbon black allows us to um, reduce those CO2 emissions in our manufacturing process because it takes only one third the amount of CO2 emissions to make recovered carbon black over new carbon black. And then the final um, kind of thinking to the future piece is tires that operate in a different way. So right now we have tires filled with air. Um, maybe in the future we'll have tires filled with um, with no air and it'll be a totally different um, way to operate. Uh, there'll be less material used and it'll be um, able to be retreaded more often. So as we move to that next generation thinking, we're constantly trying to come up with ways to reduce those CO2 emissions, um, and then that will be passed through to you as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys, that was really great. Um, I got a couple questions for each one of you, and then we'll open it up for any from the um, from, from you all. So be thinking about a question for our panelists. But for um, uh, to start with, uh, uh, Jeff and Karen, I mean, how hard do you think these requirements are going to be to be to be met with the, with the new oil? I mean, we're probably in a stage where you know they, they uh, engine manufacturers have asked you for the asked the oil industry for things and lubricants. And you're probably responding. I mean, is this um, like, oh my God, you know, this is going to be really hard to do, or is it kind of like a cakewalk? Maybe from one to five, one being like really easy and five being really hard. How do, how do you see uh, this playing out? From the process side, Hello. Thanks. From the process side, it's gonna it's gonna track along with all of the previous categories that that, that we've developed. Uh, we have a long track record uh, at API and the same consensus process that we that I talked about during my talk and Karen referenced a little bit uh, of, of initiating these new categories every time a new step change uh, needs to come. So the companies that are involved in this, we've been doing it for decades and decades. So I have every confidence that the difficulty levels are, 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 are gonna be minimal. Uh, they've done this before. We've, uh, we've crossed several bridges that were very difficult and this is just the, taking that another step further. So I, I'll let Karen speak to the difficulty from her side. I think it's gonna be quite, we're gonna get there. I, I agree and I think that's because we spent a lot of time up front. You know, we had to have a, enough of a stretch goal to justify uh, taking on the initiative and, and changing everything over in the industry it had to be um, enough of a goal to do that um, but at the same time it has to be something that that's that we're able to accomplish and when we're increasing the performance requirements of several different parameters all at once and the performance of each kind of offsets the other it, it is a challenge but we did the work up front to have real clarity on what was needed and you know how much we could push the technology kind of into the next area um, and still be able to be successful in the end. There's a lot going on with 2027 engines. Um, we've got NOx reductions uh, by the uh, EPA, but we've also got the, a greenhouse gas rule step that happens for fuel efficiency as well. And the engine manufacturers are talking about, you know, high 40%, 48, 47, 48, 49% brake thermal efficiency of these engines. So there's a lot going on with these engines. And I'm sure this is just Part of it. Uh, how, how, does, how, does the, how does those requirements play into what the engine manufacturers are asking about how they will? Um, I'll go ahead. So uh, again, it's it's kind of leading into the, the preparation, the EMA, the engine manufacturers. They know what their targets are, and they've got you know, some time to meet them. Of course, they'd all ask for more time, but. They know what their strategy is, so they're able to come to us and say, you know, we need a little bit more of this or a little bit less of this. We need to, you know, cut back a little bit on the um, some of the chemistries to make sure that we extend the life of the after treatment systems and meet that goal. And then they want the lower viscosity so that they can meet the efficiency goal. So it's it's them coming up front and saying this is having clarity on, on this is what we we need from from the performance of the oil. All right. Well, we'll look for an update in March of 25 from here, Matt's. <laughs> uh, Ryan, it, it, uh, your first picture of the Starship uh, had cows in the background. 
<laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, a natural gas engine, you know, is extremely sustainable when it uh, uses renewable natural gas. So was that part of Shell's decision to go with uh, a natural gas engine in Starship 3.0? And can you just walk us through, you know, dairy natural gas or, or you know, uh, renewable natural gas made from dairy methane is, uh, you know, a big sustainability play. You walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So um, let me let me start with the why first. Uh, we've always positioned Starship and aligned it closely to the trans energy transition in the sector itself. So, um, you know, 1.0 and 2.0, it was very much based on diesel platforms because that was relevant at the time. Also, you had a uh, you had the hardware and you had significant advancements in the hardware as well as you had an established supply chain and, and maintenance and fueling network in place. So diesel was never a challenge. That was six years ago. What's happened in the past decade is natural gas has been taking a more central role in terms of energy supply. And it's been doing that because the infrastructure is now in place. So you have a fueling, a maintenance infrastructure, you have a dealer network, uh, you have an aftermarket network that can support the customer. But it's being driven also from the sustainability piece, which is basically um, a bit of a chemistry lesson here, yeah? but effectively what happens is uh, renewable natural gas is basically derived from organic matter. And what happens is we collect, and this organic matter can be from different sources. It can be food, it can be landfill, it can be agricultural waste. So the cows, dairy energy, is basically one of the highest rate CI uh, carbon intensity uh, avoided emissions. So it sits around 250%. Um, so it's one of the highest you can use. Um, in that portfolio of facilities, we have these large anaerobic digesters, and we feed the organic matter into these digesters, and they're effectively large mechanical stomachs. And in them, you have these microorganisms when the microorganisms feed on the organic matter, they produce gas. And that in the gas in its raw form is biogas. Uh, and that biogas has methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, so it's very raw, it's unpurified. So we then collect it, we filter it, and we clean it. And that is the renewable natural gas that you get at the end of the day that can be directly injected into the natural distribution, uh, sorry, natural gas distribution grid, can be used directly as a fuel, and it's pretty fungible because it can double as uh, compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas. Uh, so yeah, from a, from a, from a uh, portfolio standpoint and a platform, natural gas is here now and readily available, and the Starship initiatives about showcasing technologies and solutions that can be readily adopted now to make an impact. Excellent, very good. And the 9MPG, diesel gallon equivalent is a pretty extraordinary number for, for natural gas and uh, proves or just shows again how efficient that uh, that tractor is regardless of what power plant it's in. Yeah, uh, especially if you if you take into account that diesel engines, I mean the natural gas engine versus the diesel engine is on average about 12% less efficient just because of the thermal weight, it, it, the thermal management and the heat rejection. And the engines are getting better because five years, five years ago, they were 20% less efficient. So you've seen that margin close. Yeah. So nine miles is a good, a good benchmark. It's an extraordinary number for fuel economy on a gas engine. Yeah, very good. Tanya, uh, did you say the OG of sustainability in tires was retro? It is uh, retreading? I absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. I, mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, what, what, uh, what do you think about it? Or why do you say that? Because, so we've been retreading tires for 30 some years, right? 50 years actually, but it's really become popular in the last 30 years. And when you think about a retreaded tire, you're taking your already fuel efficient casing and you're just renewing it. So you're not requiring new manufacturing of new product. You're not requiring us to go out and um, harvest new rubber or dig up and mine new um, raw materials in order to put in that tire. So we're saving um, CO2 across the board um, there. And that's really, and we've been doing it for so long, right? And it, we need to encourage that to continue and encourage that retreading of tires 
to happen more often. So instead of only retreading your tire one time, maybe maybe your new spec says we'll do it three times or we'll strive to get to three times by you know 2025 or 2030. Because the more we can reuse and renew what we currently have, the, the quicker we'll get to that zero emission future. Excellent. So anybody have any questions in the audience? Yeah, right up here. Big question there, sir. Yeah, I think, and, and, you know, it's like, how do we all lean in on some of these sustainability recycling pieces and how can we help support some of these things that, you know, uh, renewable natural gas that Brian was talking about, and Tanya was retreading and so forth, and just, you know, working as a, you know, a, not just a trucking industry, but just like a real public around some of these things. What thoughts do you have on that, anybody? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I think one of the challenges we're gonna have is as we move to, in particular, in, in my product, um, you know, new materials like renewable rubber or the recycled carbon black, the, the stumbling block we're gonna find is capacity, right? Because it does take a long time to create new technology and it takes a long time to get that new technology up to capacity. So that is going to be our challenge for the future and really pushing the industry needs to say, this is where we want to go, and then the suppliers will come and say, okay, we're going to get there. We promise to, to get there for you, right? So we really need the industry to push for that in order for us to get to that next step. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. So I think it's 100% it's about regulatory influence, right? Um, in, terms of, in terms of what you were asking initially with the with the, with the opportunity that now exists because this is a different type of fuel source. Um, you have to be careful in that because there's not enough natural gas to power the entire US trucking fleet, right? It, I think what gets us to that 20, 20 50 target, which is uh, we have to re re recognize a 60% drop in emission intensity by 2050, and by then, road freight is expected to double in volume. So you've got that going up and you've got emissions needing to come down. So it's a lot of different solutions that get us over the line or help move the needle closer. Like hydrogen, natural gas, uh, battery electric, uh, and even hybrid solutions in that space. Uh, long story short, uh, the CARB, which is the California Air, Dro Air Resource Board, classifies these different fuel types according to these avoided emissions. So it's worth looking at that and then basing your decisions on where that you know that that capital that agriculture contributes in that in that spectrum. I don't have much to add other than to say that's a great question and it made me want to go back and watch Back to the Future again when Doc comes back and put the stuff right right in the engine. But uh, you know I, I I work a little bit um, on the sustainability side for the lubricants industry and the lubricants industry is heavily focused on reducing their own uh, their own carbon footprint uh, through anal analyzing their life cycles of all their products uh, standardizing this uh, it's happening across the globe and uh, I'm just you know I'm, I'm happy to see many 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 organizations 
all of the ones that are up here are really concerned about it and, and working together to uh, you know bring us that that sustainable zero emission future that I know I would like for my children. So I don't think I know anybody that doesn't want to give their kids a better environment. So kudos to the industry, and I I, I continue I'll continue to help them push towards the or push towards these targets. Yes, sir. Clear in the back. Is, is that it? Anything else? I've got one more. Yes, sir. What is the, uh, there, there's no free lunch on the removable tire. You obviously add mass to that to allow something to be removed. What is the hit on the overall um, efficiency and rolling resistance on the tire with, by making it removable as opposed to making it one time throw it away? Well, I mean, there's obviously some trade off. Well, how much is it? How effective? Yeah, in case you couldn't hear it, I mean, one of the, the questions basically, if you didn't design it for retreadability, uh, you know, are you giving up anything in the in the base tire? Could it be better? Could it be designed better? And, and what are the trade-offs? So, yeah, with respect to rolling resistance, fuel efficiency. Yeah, so I, I think I think we need to be clear, though, between regroovable and retreadable, right? So regroovable is kind of a thing of the past. Um, it's where uh, many bus tires did it, right? Where we added kind of an extra tread and after it wore down a bit, they would add new grooves on their own by hand with a, essentially a knife. It was crude. Um, and it, it gave them a little more tread life um, in order to, to, to keep using that tire. But then at the end of that life, we moved to what we call retreadable. Right? So a retread is where you bump off any remaining casing because, or any remaining tread, which we all pull our tires somewhere between, uh, what, like four, 30 seconds maybe, because two DOT limit. And you bump off that little bit of remaining tread and you apply a new tread to it. It is essentially a brand new tire when you're done because we re-vulcanize that tread to the casing. Um, however, you didn't create a new tire because you're using your old casing. So you only use about a third of the material and a third of the energy that would, you would use for a new tire. Now, the trade-offs are our casings are always fuel efficient, but you do still have to think about what tread you're applying and, and choose one that's fuel efficient or that works best for your application. Right? There is really no trade-off on retreading. There is a trade-off on regrouping, but again, not many people do that anymore. Um, retreadability is really about the durability of that casing and ensuring that it can be used over and over. So you just need to select one that you know will be retreadable, which I typically say is a brand name US company um, that, that you can, can count on having a durable, durable tire that lasts a long time. Well, great. We're out of time. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for coming. And um, thank you, Shell Rotella, for hosting this panel and for the for all of you um, with some great thoughts. We'll be around uh, somewhere if you want to go up and uh, ask any additional questions. But um, thank you guys very much.